Thank you, Tom. I'm so glad that we're here to worship God, not to not put on a show. Um, as a show, that kind of rough around the edges, but I think the worship so far has been wonderful. And Scott, just think someday we're going to get to Psalm 119. I think I'm going to ask you to read that. <laughs> <laughs> because, because I have a big mouth, right? One. It's been a mouth. Can you put it up in the t-shirt? Two readers. Tonight, would you please turn to me to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. We'll be beginning verse 17. First John is right after Second Peter, right before Second John. First John chapter four, beginning of verse seventeen. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Last week we saw three texts, three evidences of whether or not you abide in God and God abides in you. Now those three tests, three questions were, do you have the Holy Spirit do you confess that Jesus is the Son of God? And do you abide in love? All three are necessary results of God dwelling in the human soul. Tonight, uh, again, 1 John 4, verses 17 to 21, uh, we're going to continue to look at the last of these tests, abiding in love. Uh, more specifically, we're looking at a perfected love, a completed love. Love is, is the chief and prime virtue. Without it, we have nothing. We are nothing without love. 1 Corinthians 13 makes this clear again and again. Uh, the ability to speak in the tongues of angels or American Sign Language. Uh, prophetic powers, all-conquering faith, uh, an ultimate sacrifice. Without love are worthless. They're, they're nothing. And, and Paul doesn't simply say that prophetic powers without love are worthless. He says if he has all prophetic powers and out no love, that he is nothing. A man without love is, is nothing. A woman without love is nothing. But a man who has love has everything. The two great commandments of Jesus Christ, uh, Matthew 22, 37 to 40, are to love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, Matthew what? Matthew 22, verses 37 to 40. James 2.8 calls love the royal law. Uh, Paul calls it the fulfillment of the law in Romans 13.10. And in John, John talks about love almost constantly. Uh, it's constantly on his lips, constantly at the tip of his pen. Uh, I, I did a little bit of math this week. This letter has a total of 355 words. 355 words. 36 of those are love. Better than one in every ten words in this letter is the word love. The only, the only noun that appears more often is God. Love is 
an absolute essential in the Christian life, in our life. So let's learn more about it. First, let's pray again. Lord, Lord, we ask that tonight you would be our vision, or that nothing else would be on our minds but you. Lord, we ask you would still all of the distractions. Lord, that for family, finances, jobs, health, everything else, Lord, would be, would be set aside for the next few minutes. Lord, that we would think of, of nothing but you and your word. Lord, you are love. Help us to love. In Jesus' name, amen. 1 John 4, 17. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in the world. So the major points of, of this verse, of this passage, what is perfected love? What perfects our love? And what does perfected love do? Yes. What is perfected love? What perfects our love? And what does perfected love do? Anytime you can slow down or repeat. Just... So what is perfected love? Last week, we talked about the meaning of love. Uh, we said that it is a commitment of the will to do good for another, even at cost to self. Um, in fact, just, just the other night, my uh, wife and I caught a little trailer for the uh, movie Frozen, Disney movie. Um, the only part I saw was when the snowman, I think his name is, is Olaf, um, is helping the princess, whose name I never heard, um, like she's sick and cold. He starts a fire and uh, you know, drags her over to it and uh, they're talking about love. And he says love is caring about somebody more than yourself. And he says some people are worth melting for. Um, and I mean, that's, it's a cheesy Disney movie, but, but that's the right definition of love. You know, it's, it's not romantic feelings. It's being more concerned for someone else's welfare than your own. This snowman was, was willing to melt uh, to help the princess. Um, love is doing good for others, even at a cost to yourself. So what is a perfected love? It's, it's this love that is complete, that lacks nothing. Um, it has no faults. There's nothing present alongside this love that shouldn't be there. There's nothing lacking from this love that should be there. Perfect love is, is a love that's concerned for nothing more than the good of the one who is loved. A love that will do no harm, a love that will make any sacrifice for the loved one. Perfect love is, is marked by self-forgetfulness. We, we forget about ourselves in our concern for another. Perfected love holds nothing back. It's, it's a love without reservation. So where does this love come from? It's, it's not something that we can just bring forth out of our own efforts, our own will. Uh, we're told here, by this is love perfected with us. By this. The word this is, is a pronoun, so we have to figure out what its antecedent is. Do that in just for Jeremy to try to transfer it. It's better than I am. What, what does this refer to? Um, it's the, the preceding verse told God is love and whoever abides in love 
abides in God and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us. Love is perfected in us because God abides in us and God is love. It's a Christian love. Love dwells within you. God loves within you. God's love is perfect. He lives within us. Love is perfected in us. You, you can't have the person who is love living inside of you and not be changed Amen. by it. Perfect love lives within the Christian. He will perfect the love in our lives. Uh, here I, I need to add that this is not a spontaneous process. Um, God likes to work over time. Um, girls, how many days did God take to create the world? Seven. Six. And on the seventh day he rested. Seven is a, that's okay. God created the world in six days. It, it didn't need to take six days. Um, he, you know, all, all he had to do was say, let there be light, and there was light. Uh, he could have just said all those in order in one day, but he chose to do it over time. When he took the Israelites out of the land of Egypt and brought them to the promised land, uh, girls, any of you know how long they spent in the wilderness? 40 days, 40 nights? No, 40 is right. Not days. 40 days, 40 years. 40 years. The flood rained for 40 days and 40 nights. I think that's what you're thinking. But, you know, he, he spent 40 years bringing the Israelites out of Egypt into, into the promised land. Um, like he could have just immediately, you know, transported them out of Egypt and put them there. Or even, if he wanted them to walk across the desert, that would have only taken about a month. Um, but he had plans for Israel, plans that he worked out over time. I give many more examples, but, but God works in time. The act, the work of sanctification, of the removal of sin, the putting on of righteousness, it happens over time in the believer. So don't be discouraged if your love is, is not yet perfect. Mine certainly isn't. It's hard to believe, but it's not. Um, it'd be easier to believe with my wife. We're not working tonight. But ask yourself, is your love being perfected? Do you love more now than you did previously? I, I certainly love more now than I did a year ago. Are there people here tonight whom I love dearly and imperfectly, but a year ago, I wouldn't have given them the time of day. Uh, they would have just been an annoyance, an inconvenience, my terribly busy schedule. Uh, now, I love them, and I'm happy to be inconvenienced for them. I, I want them to experience good, to know God, and, and I will sacrifice my time and energy for them. Love is being perfected within me. Is it being perfected within you? Then what is the result of this perfected love? Uh, first, the obvious one, if love is perfected in you, then you will love perfectly. Um, you'll truly, constantly, consistently consider others more significant than yourselves, more important. Uh, we won't take advantage of other people. We won't refrain from helping others because of what it will cost us. We will always, always seek their good. And we will know <coughs> that their greatest good, the only perfect good, is God. But there's another result of perfected love, and it's, it's this. Again, verse 17. So that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. So that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. What, what is the day of judgment? It's quite simply the day on which God 
judges the world. Not only the world in, in the universal, yes, he will condemn the world as fallen. He will condemn the nations as, as sinful. But he will also judge every single individual in the world. The, the day of judgment is both universal and individual. And the Christian is not exempt. Uh, just listen to 1 Corinthians 3, 13-15. Paul says, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Paul's talking to and about Christians, Because he says, even if their works are worthless, they will be saved. The judgment's not only, are you in Christ or are you out of Christ, but it's, what's the quality of, of the works that you've done? Mm -hmm. you've built upon? For the Christian, your salvation is not at stake, but rewards or loss are. And I'll confess it, that, that scares me. I'm scared of being judged on all the worthless works that I have devoted so much of my time to, of all the, the ways that I have failed to love like I should, of the many ways in which I am self-centered and short-tempered. Um, A.W. A. Tozer said, and I agree with him, I'm not so much concerned about being judged for the things I've done, because my sins are covered by the blood of Christ, but for the things I haven't done, things I should have done. And I also got to say, I really have no idea what these rewards or losses are going to be. Um, when we preach through 1 Corinthians, I'm put a lot more thought into it and try to come up with a fuller answer. I can't imagine any reward beyond being in the presence of God and seeing the face of God. Um, and I can't imagine what kind of loss we could suffer when we're in that reward. Amen. But the Bible says some will receive a reward and some will suffer loss. So I don't understand it, but I believe it. There is a, a day of judgment. So again, we have two questions to worry about in the day of judgment. Will I be judged to be in or out of Christ? And will my works endure? Will they perish? Now, perfected love will remove both fears. The end of verse 17 says, Because as he is, so also are we in the world. As he is, so also are we in the world. Perfect love can only come from God dwelling inside of us. Only a Christian can have a truly perfected love. If you have a perfect love, you can be confident. You can be certain that God lives within you. And then also, who is our example of perfect love? It's Jesus Christ. If love is perfected in us, then we will be doing the same kinds of things that Jesus did. Our works will be the same as His. We will love as He loved. And what greater confidence can we have that our works are of value than if they're controlled by the same love that Jesus had, that Jesus has? We need to have no fear of judgment if love is perfected with us. Verse 18 confirms this very point. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not been perfected in love. Fear has to do with punishment. And who's the only one who can truly 
punish us. It's God. That's why Jesus said, do not fear those who can merely destroy the body and after that can do nothing to you, but fear him who can both destroy the body and destroy the soul in hell. God is the only one we need to fear. But perfected love will remove that fear. Then verse 19 tells us that this is not a work that we can do on our own. We love because He first loved us. We love because He first loved us. Our love is a response to God's love. He is the cause. Our love is the effect. We, we can't love on our own. Our sinful nature will not permit it. We only love because He first loved us. If you would, please turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Amen. We were dead in our trespasses. We were children of wrath. Friends, our sins against God are far greater than anyone has ever wronged you, no matter what they've done to you. Your offense to God has been greater. He created us. He gave us life. He gave us every good thing, and we have rebelled against Him. But God, great in mercy, because of the great love with which He loved us, made us alive while we were dead. Don't try to earn your way into God's good graces by loving. You can't do it. We can only love because God loved us. Verse 20. It's really the same point uh, that we had in verse 16 last week, just coming from the opposite direction. Verse 16, 1 John 4, 16, tells us that if we, whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. If we abide in love, we know that we abide in God. Here we're told, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. Just as love is an incontrovertible, uh, just as love is indisputable, is that better? Um, I did not write this. Undeniable. Is that better? Just as love is proof that we abide in God. So hatred is proof, certain proof, that we do not love God, that we have not experienced His love, that we are not in Him. It's impossible to love God and hate our brothers. God is love. We can't love love and hate our brothers. So there's a natural question 
to ask here. Um, we have, a, at least I have a tendency to, to paraphrase the question that the lawyer asked Jesus uh, right before the parable of Good Samaritan. The lawyer said, who is my neighbor? After Jesus said, you must love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, the question I want to ask here is, well, who's my brother? Who do I have to love? Uh, I'm always sinfully eager to restrict my responsibilities as much as I can. Searching the scriptures, uh, there's only two uses for the word brother. Uh, it refers either to a physical sibling or a, a spiritual one. Um, God, the Bible, doesn't speak about you know, a, a universal brotherhood of mankind. Um, this verse is telling us that we have to love our brothers and sisters in Christ. A, a hatred for our fellow Christians is incompatible with a love of God. There's three reasons for this. Uh, first, verse 21. This commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. A Christian has to love his brother because God's commanded us to love our brother. Second reason, as we saw last week, God lives within the Christian. Uh, for a Christian to hate another Christian is for that Christian to hate the God who lives in his brother and in himself. It's, it's a self. It's a self hatred. It's it's impossible. It's it's absurd. We can't. If God lives within us, we, we can't hate him. We can't hate him in another person. And third, as, as Genesis one makes clear all of mankind is created in the image of God. If, if we love God, how can we hate those who bear His image? We cannot. And that last point actually makes the question, who is my brother, irrelevant. Um, every human bears the image of God. We must love our brothers and sisters in Christ, but we must also love our neighbors, because we're also commanded to do that. Matthew uh, twenty-two, thirty-nine. And in the parable, the Good Samaritan teaches us that everyone we meet is our neighbor. All of humanity bears the image of God. God loves the entire world. And if God dwells in us, we also must love the world and all the people in it. Does, does that sound ridiculous? To you? Does it seem like a, a beautiful idea, but something impossible to do in real life? It, it's only impossible if you're thinking, well, how can I do this on my own? You can't. But God can. And He can do it through you. We, at least I, often, you know, I, I love church history. I read about great. Christian men and women of past eras, I mean, from you know, Paul and Peter in the Bible down to, I mean, I could list a lot of names, Augustine, Martin Luther, Jordan Mueller, A.W. Tozer. We see these great examples of Christian love and we think, well, I'm just a normal person. I, I can't do that. They were, those were great men. I took a class on great Christian men. Um, and we think, well, those were great men, and I'm just a regular guy. I can't be like that. That's it's a lie. It's straight out of hell. Because the same God who lived within Paul, the same God who lived within Tozer, it's the same God who lives within me. And the same God who lives within you, if you are a Christian. There's not a limit to who you can be as a Christian. Um, those of you who are participating in, in the Behold Your God study just last week, you heard the phrase that every Christian has can have as much of God as he wants to. 
Every Christian has as much of God as he wants to. God dwells within us. Our only limits are the limits we put upon ourselves. Our own refusals to walk in love. Again, we can't, and we can't do it on our own. Repent from your sins. Seek the face of God. Trust in the death of Jesus Christ on the cross to fully reconcile you to God. And God will live in you, and you will live in God. And love will be perfected in you, and you will live forever. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, you are love. Lord, even when we were dead in our trespasses, you love us. God, such a high sacrifice for Christ to die for our sins. Lord, thank you for loving us. Lord, cause us to love you as we have been loved. Jesus' name.